Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about the Clean Energy Demonstration Program on Current and Former Mine Land, or CEML as we like to call it, and the recently announced project selections. My name is Kelly Cummins, and I'm the Acting Director of the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, commonly referred to as OSED. Next slide, please. Before we begin this session, I want to go over a few webinar logistics. You can turn on live captions by clicking on show captions in your control panel. To turn on Spanish or ASL interpretation, please click on the interpretation button in your control panel. Finally, you will be able to find a recording of this webinar and a copy of the presentation slides on our website in the next few days. My team and I are so pleased to speak with you today about OSED and the CEML projects that we have selected to enter into award negotiations. In this briefing, we will discuss key information for each of the five selected projects. We also want to explain what you can expect uh, next, including upcoming opportunities for engagement and more information about our negotiations process. While we're not taking questions today, we invite you to share your perspective and feedback through the email address we will provide at the end of the presentation. OSED will also be co-hosting five virtual community briefings for each of the selected projects to hear directly from the local communities. Details on those briefings will be shared later on in this webinar. I'm thrilled to share that yesterday, March 21st, the US Department of Energy's Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations announced 475 million for five clean energy projects on current and former mine land. America's energy and mining communities have powered our nation for generations. The projects announced yesterday will help us ensure that these communities continue to play a critical role as we build towards an inclusive and equitable clean energy future. A key benefit of these projects is that they support diverse, locally driven efforts that can be replicated in current and former mining communities across the country. That gives us the opportunity to leverage the millions of acres of mine land across the nation for clean energy development reducing impacts on sensitive natural and agricultural land that communities care about. I also want to highlight something we care deeply about in my office at DOE. We are dedicated to ensuring the benefits of the clean energy transition flow directly to the communities that we're investing in. A stark contrast from the legacy of underinvestment and environmental degradation of the past energy infrastructure projects. Our selected projects are expected to expand local and regional workforce partnerships and generate local tax revenues, which would support essential public services and spur new economic opportunities. What's more, President Biden's Justice 40 initiative aims to ensure that 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments, including OSED's programs, positively impact disadvantaged communities, including former coal communities and those marginalized by underinvestment. Four of the five selected projects will directly benefit disadvantaged communities as defined by the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, and the other project is located near a disadvantaged community. To reflect these robust commitments, we have worked hard to develop Community Benefits Plans, or CBPs. The CBPs, which we will discuss in this briefing, are expected to go beyond division or assessment and align with the needs and priorities of impacted communities and include actionable goals, outcomes, and propose clear metrics to measure success. We are thrilled to provide more details on how the five projects selected for negotiations demonstrate these commitments. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to share these updates with you today. I look forward to our ongoing partnership as we work together to move towards a clean energy future. With this program and OSED's many other investments, we are on our way to meeting our goal of 100% clean electricity, by 2035 and supporting communities all over the United States in the transition to the clean energy economy. I'd like to start out by explaining a bit about OSED and our role within the Department of Energy. OSED was established in December 2021 by the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, more commonly known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law to scale the clean energy technologies needed to tackle our nation's most pressing climate challenges and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. OSED's mission, mission is to deliver clean energy demonstration projects at scale in partnership with the private sector to accelerate deployment, market adoption, and the equitable transition to a decarbonized energy system. 
A key part of our mission is to ensure an equitable transition to a decarbonized energy system. We want to invest in projects in the safest and most transparent way possible. Community input not only shapes the specific projects, OSED funds, but also shapes our comprehensive approach to building out the clean energy industry. Before we get into the specific projects selected for negotiations, I want to provide more information on the purpose of the CEML program. The bipartisan infrastructure law authorizes DOE to invest $500 million in the CEML program, which is managed by OSED. After releasing the funding opportunity announcement in April 2023, the program received 98 concept papers and 23 of those were encouraged to submit full applications. After a rigorous merit review process, five applications were selected for award negotiations, which we are sharing more about today. The purpose of the CEML program is to demonstrate the technical and economic viability of deploying clean energy on current or operating and former abandoned or inactive mine land. Two of these projects selected for negotiation are on active mine land in the West. Two of the projects, these two projects aim to decarbonize mining operations and secure low carbon domestic clean energy supply. Three projects selected for negotiation are on former coal mine land in Appalachia. These projects aim to repurpose the inactive mining sites, make use of pre-existing energy infrastructure, and revitalize local economies. Projects selected for negotiations under this funding opportunity aim to demonstrate a variety of innovative clean energy technologies, many of which could improve grid stability or energy reliability, which of course has broader benefits to communities. The statute required at least two of the five selected projects include solar. The selected projects have the potential to deploy hundreds of megawatts of solar photovoltaics or solar PV. Another demonstrated technology is battery energy storage systems or BESS, which store energy and make it available for use when it's most needed. A third technology that could be demonstrated is microgrids which are small localized grids that can disconnect from the main grid to play a key role in energy resilience. Another grid reliable, reliability technology that could be demonstrated is pumped storage hydroelectric, which works by pushing water uphill when electricity demand is low and then releasing water downhill to provide electricity during high demand. A fifth technology is geothermal clean heat, which is a process that harnesses heat from deep in the earth to provide a direct clean heating source. So what are some of the potential benefits from these technologies and the overall program? Some highlights include reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving grid stability, creating local good paying jobs and workforce development opportunities, preserving agricultural and natural land, repurposing existing energy infrastructure on mine land, supporting mining decarbonization to secure the domestic clean energy supply chain. And we'll go into more detail on these benefits in later slides. I wanna spend a little more time here talking about OSED's overall approach to community benefits. All of OSED's programs, including the CEML program are covered by the Biden administration's Justice 40 initiative. Justice 40 creates a goal that 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments including those in clean energy, flow to disadvantaged communities. I want to highlight that the 40% refers to the benefits of funding, not 40% of the funding itself. The Justice 40 initiative does not provide any separate or additional funding to these projects, but creates a strong accountability and transparency framework so that the energy transition can be equitable. DOE is implementing Justice 40 through our community benefits plan process, which is a key to the success of each project. Community benefits plans have four interdependent parts. First, community and labor engagement, which seeks to involve those impacted in decisions that affect them and create projects responsive to the needs of communities and workers. Second, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, or DEIA, which seeks to help build a clean energy economy reflective of all Americans and ensure equitable access to wealth building opportunities for all especially for those facing systemic barriers to employment or entrepreneurship. Third, investing in the American workforce, 
to build the skilled long-term workforce needed to power the energy transition, create quality, family-sustaining jobs with the free and fair choice to join or form a union, and ensure quality jobs are open to all Americans. And fourth, the Justice 40 initiative to maximize project benefits, minimize harms, and support the goal that 40% of benefits accrue to disadvantaged communities so that all communities can help lead the clean energy economy. Each CEML project was required to develop a community benefits plan to ensure that local communities and workers are engaged in these projects from the outset and receive concrete benefits. And OSED will provide robust project management oversight of the CBP implementation throughout the project life cycle. OSED's engagement with communities and tribes is beginning during negotiations, while we work with selectees to strengthen their community benefits and incorporate input. If OSED awards funds to these projects, the community benefits will evolve as the projects are developed, resulting in measurable impacts, and those commitments will be shared publicly. Now that you have more context for the program and how it fits into our climate and equity goals, I'll turn things over to Todd Schrader, our Director of Project Management at OSED, to share more details about the projects we've selected for award negotiations. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, good to be here uh, with everyone today. So uh, as Kelly mentioned, there were five projects selected uh, across the country. The legislation itself did require geographic diversity, uh, but as you can imagine, the, the projects are uh, centered on areas that have a history of mining. Uh, two out west, the uh, uh, active uh, mines themselves, and three in the rest, which are uh, formal mine sites. And we'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail uh, coming up. So next slide, please. Um, so what, what are some of the potential benefits? You know, one, one of the things that makes these really exciting are uh, these are really first kind, first use kind of activities on these mines former and active. And, and just some of the things, I'll, I'll start with that middle column there and come over. Uh, novel approach of using geothermal energy for copper recovery. Um, you know, pump storage hydro on a former coal mine, first time ever. Uh, and one of the largest solar projects on, uh, built in Pennsylvania, on former mine land. And, and what's really exciting about work on former mine land is, is there are not always uh, a lot of use cases for former mine lands uh, due to the work that was done formally. This is a great reuse of the land itself, these, these solar projects going forward. Uh, there's going to be workforce development activities. Uh, all of them uh, will have some kind of either training or apprenticeship program. Uh, three of them are exploring project labor agreements, collective bargaining agreements. Uh, in many cases, they have uh, the, the former mine lands have long histories with their workforces. Uh, going forward, and this is a chance to reutilize those very skilled workforce. Uh, and then local economic development, a significant tax revenue uh, for communities that have suffered population declines or, or uh, losses in tax base uh, within them. Um, and in the, for, in the uh, currently active mines, it's a chance to further community development uh, and to uh, further enhance the, uh, activities and relationships these mines already have with their local communities going forward. Next slide, please. Um, so let's just talk very quickly about the five projects. Uh, we'll start out west in South uh, East Arizona, copper recovery in Arizona for the domestic energy supply chain, uh, large mine out there, actually two, two different projects uh, relatively close to each other uh, on uh, uh, land owned by Freeport Minerals or operations by Freeport Minerals Corporation. You can see the two counties there, uh, the federal cost share of $80 million. And what this is, is a geothermal project and associated microgrids uh, and um, um, battery storage. Uh, not only will they, the geothermal project allow for enhanced recovery of copper from previous combined ores, uh, but the, the battery storage and microgrid will allow further expansion of renewable uh, power in the future, uh, all in a, uh, um, in an effort to decarbonize these critical mining activities uh, that are important, not only to the country, but these minerals are important for future clean energy projects going forward. Uh, you can see there uh, community benefits, there's construction jobs and operation jobs and uh, building on the longstanding relationship with uh, Native American tribes in the area. Next slide, please. 
uh, back to Kentucky. This is the Lewis Ridge project. So this is a pump storage hydro where uh, you take advantage of uh, allowing water to flow from a higher pond, pool, or reservoir down to a lower. And as it flows down, uh, it goes to uh, energy producing turbines, uh, which generate power. It's a form of uh, energy storage itself. Uh, upwards of 287 megawatts can be generated uh, capacity 672,000 megawatt hours. And that's enough for 67,000 homes, uh, as you can see there. Uh, as it's built into the grid, uh, upwards of over 16 states can take advantage of this capability uh, when needed. Uh, again, the project is in Bell County, Kentucky. So that's uh, southeastern Kentucky, I believe. Federal cost share $81 million. Uh, this is the uh, first pump storage hydro on closed or former mine lands ever. So uh, it's exciting opportunity, perhaps uh, demonstrate a uh, technology that can be used in other mine lands potentially going forward. Uh, you can see the benefits there is increased uh, resiliency and reliability, low, lowering the uh, energy burden, uh, particularly the emissions, uh, lots of uh, significant amount of money from tax revenue, uh, a lot of construction jobs for this big project. Uh, and partnering with local colleges on apprenticeship programs. Next slide, please. Uh, back out west to northern Nevada uh, in decarbonizing gold mines in Nevada. Uh, this is a solar photovoltaic or PV project with battery energy storage on the mines themselves. And, and this in particular will allow the mining operations to become decarbonized, uh, at least leading that way. You can see potentially upwards of three and a half million tons of CO2 over the lifetime avoided with a project like this. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You see the counties there, those are all Northern Nevada, uh, cost share of $95 million for this project. Uh, again, a significant number of construction jobs associated with this project. Uh, the uh, mine operator itself, Nevada Gold Mines, uh, has a, a long history of working with the local community, and we would expect that continue in the form of internships and mentorships, technical training, et cetera, uh, that you see there, uh, and the use of community development committees to allow uh, the local community to have input or to provide input to the projects as they move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, moving up into central Pennsylvania, <coughs> excuse me, Minimal Basin, <coughs> Clearfield County, uh, cost share of $90 million. This is again, it's a uh, PV project. This is a former mine uh, itself. And so, as I mentioned, sometimes there's not always a large number of land uses for former mines. This is a good one. 402 megawatts will be, uh, if not the largest, one of the largest, certainly within the state of Pennsylvania period, as far as solar PV, enough to power 70,000 uh, homes. Uh, community benefits, you see there, construction jobs, uh, lots of them, 750 construction jobs, investments uh, of upwards of $20 million in the workforce uh, in the area, uh, over a million dollars in tax revenue, annual tax revenue, um, uh, and uh, some community uh, improvements uh, being uh, generated from these kind of projects with grants to communities uh, or others. And again, having the ability to take advantage of the local workforce uh, for this type of project. Next slide, please. And our last one here in uh, West Virginia. Uh, this is a, another solar project. As Kelly mentioned, two of these projects had to be solar. Uh, this is the second of them. Uh, again, a former mine uh, site. Uh, it's actually two of them right next to each other. Uh, 250 megawatts total, enough for about uh, just under 40,000 homes in West Virginia. Uh, a real key to this project is a uh, partnership with the local community college or local college uh, in developing a workforce center to, to help with workers transitioning from coal to other uh, industries. Uh, the project is in Nicholas County. You can see the name there. Uh, federal cost share, $129 million uh, from the government contribution. Uh, benefits are a significant number of construction jobs, uh, looking to uh, explore project labor agreement and significant amount of tax revenue over the uh, project's 40 year life uh, into the county itself uh, going forward. Um, so that's just touching on these five projects. They're exciting, they're, they're new and they're different. Uh, and we think there's a real chance for replicability moving forward uh, for these projects. So with that, I will turn it back over to Kelly. Thanks, Todd. An exciting group of projects.
This slide illustrates the path of engagement from when a project applies to OSED for competitive funding to when it is awarded and moves through the project management phases. I want to emphasize that we're at the very beginning of the negotiations process. These projects may take years to come to fruition, and we'll have to pass through several gates before any construction activities will start. So here we are at the beginning. Projects have been selected for the negotiation of awards. You can find project summaries, which include a summary of the initial CBPs or community benefits plans in the application on our webpage, which we will put a link uh, in the chat to right now. Uh, we've listed concrete ways you can get involved here, including reaching out to the CEML project teams or OSED directly or uh, attending one of the virtual briefings. So DOE will consider information that we learn during these briefings, uh, that we learn from correspondence, and for meeting engagements to inform our negotiation process. This means that your feedback is helping shape how projects progress. Let us know via email if you'd like to receive additional information about local engagements that will be planned in the very near future. For projects that successfully get through negotiations and receive funding in an award, there will be many, many additional ways folks can get involved. Each project will progress through a phased approach with up to four distinct phases. Engagement will be going on through all of these phases. Between each phase, DOE will assess the project's progress, including the quality of the community benefits implementation, and will make a decision about whether the project should receive additional funding. We call this a go-no-go -go decision. Excuse me. This will also allow selectees to build, improve, and actualize the community benefits plans over time, incorporating critical feedback and insights at each step. During our regional briefings, there will be opportunities for attendees to ask questions and learn more about the projects and raise concerns. As previously mentioned, OSED will be hosting five project-specific briefings for community members to learn more about the projects selected in their area, to learn more about the anticipated community benefits, and it provides an opportunity to ask questions and raise concerns. You can register today by visiting the CEML pro uh, program website, and we also just dropped a link in the chat. Additionally, all projects receiving financial assistance from DOE must be reviewed under the National Environmental Policy Act to ensure that every project gives proper consideration to the environmental effects before it is awarded. We have additional information on NEPA, as it's called, on our website, and my colleague just dropped the link in the chat. I want to make sure you can reach OSED for any questions or concerns that arise by utilizing the email shown on the screen. We are committed to ensuring your voice is heard in this process, and we look forward to receiving all of your perspectives. Please also sign up to receive OSED news and updates. This is the best resource to stay in the know about OSED. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your week to hear about the CEML demonstrations program and our five selected projects. Like I said, please do not hesitate to reach out with any questions or concerns. Thank you and have a good rest of your day.